Should these book reviews be a cultural commons? Welcome, my mere mortalites, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but also this one where I dive deeper into the books that I'm reading to extract the useful information for you, to perhaps uncover some themes which might be missed, and also to relate how the commons relate to my own podcast. So we do indeed have Commoners Air by Lewis Hyde with the subtitle Revolution, Art and Ownership. So this book was published in 2010 and it's about 250 pages in length, but do not let the length fool you, it is dense. So it probably took me about seven or eight hours to get through in total. It's basically an argument against the enclosure of ideas in the modern age and a call to return to how commons and cultural commons were treated back in the days of the founding fathers of the United States, so back in the more 1700s period. So what you'll find in this book is a lot of definitions of the modern pitfalls and abuses of IP, of copyright, of patenting. And some of the principles that you see in people like Benjamin Franklin, um, Frederick Douglass, Thomas Jefferson, and how they treated the commons. So there's nine chapters in total. And these go from do, 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 defending the cultural commons, what is a commons, the enclosure of culture, framing a commonwealth, Benjamin Franklin founding pirate, liberty to communicate, the common self, the common self now, and enduring commons. What you'll find in this book is it's all about ideas and philosophical things rather than actual number, data, and empirical evidence of why things are perhaps worse now than they were, say, 50 or more years ago. So it's really related to ideas and philosophy more than anything else. And this ties in with the author himself, Lewis Hyde. He was born in the United States in 1945, and he's an author, an essayist, a poet, I think, a a scholar. And this isn't the most popular of his his books. The others, uh, such as The Gift, which is related more to property and giving, and Trickster Makes This World, which is related to, I suppose, this disruptive creativity. Those are his more popular books, but this one I found intriguing and so got into. We're going to start off with the main theme, commons, defined by the people. So what exactly is a commons and how do you define it? Well, it's rather hard by default. He gives a a couple of attempts of, of defining it in this book. So I'll jump onto the first one here, which is on page 31. And he says, the commons are not simply the land, but the land plus the rights, customs, and institutions that organize and preserve its communal uses. The physical commons, the fields and woods and so forth, are like a theater within which the life of the community is enacted and made evident. A bit more detail about the medieval case will illustrate what I mean. And then he goes to talk about the manorial system and how the uh, tenants had rights to meadowlands and how these wastes and other parts of the land they had certain rights and and obligations uh, connected with these. So it wasn't just rights, there were some obligations. Another one here is on page 43, which I think is a bit more of a better summary. So a commons is a kind of property in which more than one person has a right of action. We can now expand on this by summarizing the ground just covered. A commons is a social regime for managing a collectively owned resource. Moreover, although it is not hard to split a commons into the parts that make it up, the commoners, their use rights, the fields where those rights are enacted. In actual practice, these parts cannot easily be separated one from another because it is the parts bundled that constitute the commons, that bring it into being. The things, fields, fish, songs, ideas, internet protocols, are where common use rights meet and the means that the things are encumbered, not readily available for private appropriation or trade. So he's definitely saying how a commons is related to an idea and it can be many different things. Uh, he listed some examples there, culture, intangible art, a lighthouse, human genome, nursery rhymes, wood in a forest, all of these sorts of things were can be considered a, a commons. And the definition somewhat seemed to be a mix of a physical place of a person, a commoner, and then a right of action, the ability to do something in that actual place itself. And he was saying how it's useful to have these uh, commons because good things can come from this. So you can have benefits to a large amount of people, i.e. people who are getting wood to um, keep themselves warm over the winter, of 
using a nursery rhyme to help your kid get to sleep at night, your baby, of mystical experiences that can come from mythology and art and uh, of these tales which have no one particular owner, but they are kind of known by everyone. So think of things like the Asgard gods of Thor, of Egyptian mythology, all of those sorts of things. This gets into, I suppose, okay, well, you've got this thing, but people are going to ruin it. People always ruin everything. And so he's talking about the the norms and I suppose communication of, of, of how these commons are somewhat protected. So they seem to be more self-governed rather than anything else. And this is by informal norms and values. So if I had a particular mythology or a song or something like this, there's informal norms of not changing the words up just because you don't like this one particular word of if you're, you've got a joint resource of the land or something like this, you act together in a way where, okay, I, maybe I won't till this part of the land and create a diversion of the water, which will then wash into my neighbor's house. And the reason these informal norms and values arise is because there's communication. And so he really gets into talking about how communication is very important in establishing these norms and values, which keep everyone happy and keep this kind of self-governance, which doesn't have strict laws and regulations of people still being able to use a meadow, a field, a um, piece of art of, of an idea and not having it restricted uh, arbitrarily or ruined by other people. And this is where we get into something called the tragedy of the commons. You've probably heard of this before. And the example made uh, from this was, uh, it was established, I suppose, in the 1800s. This is where it first came up in a pamphlet. And then in 1968, Garrett Hardin wrote an essay up upon this. I won't get too much into the details. Go check out the end of month book recap if you want the full spiel of, of why it, this essay was kind of fucked up in many different ways. But it's really a one-off thing and it's, it's, it's a misunderstood article referring to a pamphlet and it actually has very little merit. So basically the argument is uh, the tragedy of the commons is where you have a commons, let's say a pasture in this case, where you can go to feed your cows. People take their cows in and the, fowls, the, the cows get um, you know, fed and because there's no one regulating it, you can feed your cow as much as you want. And so next week you bring 100 cows and then 1,000 cows. And if everyone does this, basically the, the commons gets ruined. The, this field gets absolutely decimated because there's too many cows and too many people eating, uh, or too many animals eating from this. And you know, bad things happen from this. The, the commons gets destroyed, all the cows die, that sort of thing. This doesn't happen in reality. That is not an actual reflection of what happens in reality. What happens in reality is people bring their cows, they meet other people bringing their cows and they see, oh, a, a lot of this field is getting used up. Okay, maybe you can have this section on these certain days of the weeks so or these certain times of the year. I can have this section and then this will allow the field to regrow, the pastures to regrow and we're not going to have conflicts of me taking my cows one day and there not being any more grass. And so it's this kind of, you know, making a point based on something that's not really um, true in reality. You can take this idea and say tragedy of the commons perhaps related to overfishing of the oceans and you say, Oh, but look, the oceans have been overfished. And this is a bit more realistic because you, you, in this case, there is a somewhat lack of a communication. The fishermen aren't, because of the vast distances, they're perhaps not communicating as clearly with each other. And with modern technology, getting this ability to be able to trawl the oceans and like dig up the seabed and things like this, yes, okay, the tragedy of the commons is more of an idea in this case. Um, and so... In, there's this kind of balance where it's the commons are good in, in uh, Lewis Hyde's argument, but uh, he, he might be neglecting somewhat this, this idea of the tragedy of the commons. I think he makes a very good point in saying how this is not particularly realistic, but and there are other measures in place to stop things, uh, the tragedy of the commons occurring, which I will get on to soon. On the flip side, of his argument is what's happening nowadays. So let's look at encroachment and the copyright of patenting an idea. So that is the second theme. Who owns an idea is, is a question. Who actually owns an idea? And he goes into the book how he's talking about there's a big difference between 
the discovery of an idea and the invention of an idea. And so two examples of this, one is lightning and the idea of how lightning is actually very similar to an electrical car, uh, charge and electricity, the idea of electricity. In this case, you can have the discovery of it, but should you be able to own this idea? And he argues, no, you shouldn't be able to, but something like a lightning rod, which is making use, a practical use of the understanding of this, i.e. I can use my understanding of electricity to know these certain types of, of physical materials will conduct or won't conduct electricity. I can put this on the top of a house or a building to make use of this electricity or perhaps to even protect the actual building itself from the damage caused by a lightning strike. These sorts of things, that is more something that you should be able to patent and have a, an, a somewhat of an own ownership over and for a certain time period. And we'll get into that soon as well. Another one of this is the uh, CCR5 gene and the human genome. Should you be able to own the human genome? Well, I mean, it's kind of belongs to all of us, right? It is literally baked into me. I am the human genome. Should someone be able to, to own, own that? And therefore, if I ever wanted to make use of what is me, uh, I have to pay them or, or whatnot. No, you probably don't want that but you maybe want to be able to patent or have intellectual property right over the CCR5 gene and in particular turning this gene off, which I believe gives you some, uh, it's not immunity, but you, you can, uh, it's a, a increased res resistance to HIV in infection. So if you turn off this gene and the, the technology to maybe turn off this gene and therefore increase the ability to resist uh, HIV, you know, that is maybe something that is worthy of, of being patented because you've expanded upon an idea. You haven't discovered it, but you've invented something related to it. So what he is talking about in this book is that there's been this gradual capture, particularly over the last 50 years of what started off as everything being, uh, create everything creative being the public domain by default. If I created a book, back in the 1700s and I re released that for publication, it would be part of the public domain by default. I, I, I kind of didn't have any rights over it other than the physical selling of the book. And this has gradually shifted to being something more like uh, the 1976 copyright law, uh, which occurred in the US, which is now made by default. Everything is has the right to exclude. So therefore, I can create something, a book of some sort, and by default, I have right to exclude people from uh, making reuse of this, of rehashing it, and they all have to come to me for permission. And in fact, even if I wanted to set, make this available to the commons, i.e. I write a book and then I just let people sample it however they want, you can't even kind of do that. There is almost no way of doing that. I don't know the particular laws. I haven't looked into this too much. This is just what Lewis Hyde is saying. And there's a somewhat of a difference between copyright and patenting. And there is a patent which you can apply for, which kind of gives you ownership of the ability for everyone to by default use it. It's kind of a little bit of a weird thing, but it's this idea that there's this capturing where People are getting almost too greedy and whatnot. And this is getting into the idea of, well, why is this happening? And onto monopolies. And there's pros and cons to monopolies. We can see how having a monopoly over a patent is a good incentivizer for people to create things. So if by default I created a book, uh, you know, I spent five years of my life really researching deeply and trying to figure this one thing out and I put all my thoughts in order and whatnot, and I release this book and then random Joe on the street finds it, you know, copy paste, uh, creates his own book word for word, but perhaps changes up the cover or maybe he's uh, already more popular. And so he can sell this book to other people and, and there's no incentive. Uh, the incentive for me is gone because I can't make a, a, a profit for myself or even a name for myself um, because he's changed the name to his name as well. Okay, that's that's kind of fucked up. That's that's obviously going to be disincentivizing, and people won't create books or inventions or useful things for humanity. But what we see is that there's been the slipping into 
rent seeking type behavior. And so this is where people hoard or, or, or stay on an idea or of, um, I believe this, it's like patent farming or, or something like that, um, or patent squatting, IP squatting, where you, you hold a, uh, uh, because you get an early and you don't actually do anything with it, but you, you know, as part of the legal framework, have something attached to you, which you can control. This is where you can start to see all sorts of um, kind of ridiculous behavior. Two examples from this in the book are the Joyce estate. So of James Joyce, the very famous Irish author, a couple of book reviews I've done on this channel. We can see that that estate is being somewhat very restrictive with being able to use quotations or talking about James Joyce or his um, literature. And in particular, there was this person who was creating somewhat of an anthology of Irish writing over the the centuries, over over its history. And you can see, okay, this is kind of a beneficial thing. This would be very interesting. And James Joyce plays a large part in this. He's a very famous Irish author, probably the most famous. But the author of this anthology couldn't pay the fee I believe that's maybe the best term for it, a fee of a ridiculous amount, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands um, for, for this book they're creating. And so there's now just this huge chapter, this section of Irish writing, which doesn't even really refer to James Joyce because they're not allowed to talk about him or replicate uh, any of his works or, or showcase why he was an important Irish author that's that's kind of like mm, all right that's that's not so great you're de depriving the public of a of a, a benefit of a real nice good of knowing more about irish history another one dexter king so this is the son of martin second son of martin luther king jr he now owns the uh, intellectual property of i have a dream of the i have a dream speech of of uh, photos of his father and things like this and once again you can kind of see this kind of gross behavior where he's absolutely going after anyone and everyone who uses anything related to uh, his father, which is okay. We can kind of maybe say, you know, his father, that's, he's got a strong connection to him. Um, but also his father was part of the public domain. You know, the, I have a dream speech is integral to, to the, um, the rights movement that was occurring in the, in the United States at that time. It's part of their common culture at this point because it is such an important thing. And you kind of just go, oh, like this is getting to the territory where he's maybe being, it's going too much into the side of, of protecting, of the authors having control and protection over every little thing related to what they've created and depriving the, the, the public of a common good. Uh, there's a really nice quote here from Thomas Jefferson on page 90 and 91, which I want to read out. So he's uh, sending a letter to Isaac McPherson in 1813. And he says, if nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea, which an individual may exclusively possess as long as he keeps it to himself. But the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone, and the receiver cannot disp dispossess himself of it. Its peculiar character, too, is that no one possesses the less, because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine, so that's related to a candle, uh, receives light without darkening me. That idea should spread freely, uh, should freely spread from one to another over the globe, for the moral and mutual instruction of man and improvement of his condition of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and uh, peculiarly i hate that word and benevolently designed by nature when she made them like fire expansible over all space without lessening their density at any point and like the air in which we breathe move and have our physical being incom incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation bang there we go thomas jefferson dropping some bombs so we can see there it's really talking about ideas and how this is an idea is linked kind of closely to a common property such as air, uh, such as clean water, such as the environment. And in, then we get into the aspect of art and, and songs and movies and things like this. So it's a very complex thing. I'll summarize it by saying 
Lewis Hyde argues that we've we've made it too restrictive nowadays. We've given too much rights to um, authors and whatnot, and they use and and we need to find this nice balance of uh, incentivizing authors and people to create things, but also letting these things be distributed to the public after a time. He somewhat says that uh, the idea of of having you know a kind of a couple of decades where you might get the exclusive rights to something that you create and then after that period that being let out into the public is is much nicer but when it gets into the or maybe even to the extent of an author's lifetime sure because that is probably going to be only you know 30 to 50 years something like that but when it gets into decades and decades after an author or a person's death um and you know it's their their children and their grandchildren who are now um having all of this intellectual property and and whatnot that's where he says it's like it's going too far basically so this encroachment is is getting too much which uh is a very intriguing idea and um i think he makes a really good case as as to why that is so we're getting into my own observations and takeaways at this point the book itself is is thick and it's not solely related to the comments because he does have to explain where these comments come from and it's related to kind of flighty things, ideas, what is an idea, what is a comment, uh, what is a person. And so a couple of these chapters, I personally found a little bit boring. I, I didn't think they, they really spoke to me super deeply. So in particular, framing a commonwealth, I, I didn't, I, that chapter, just that particular chapter, I found myself mm, being a little bit bored. And then seven and eight, the common self and the common self now, those two, I, I, I kind of struggled with as well. I, I didn't get the full benefit from them. That being said, there are some other really cool ideas in this book related to civic duty of responsibility of how a commons is a beautiful thing, but there does need to have this aspect of people caring for it, of, of maintaining it, of, of putting in extra effort to maintain it. And so that it doesn't get ruined that I, I think there's a lot of merit in that in those arguments and ideas as well but if I if I go into them this book review will get super super long and my only other observation was it's heavy on the words so you're gonna have to really uh, push yourself to learn some new things if for example you will hear about plenitude inalienability metonymy eschatological agonism lucubrate so many different words which are uh, right on my boundary point of, of knowledge and you can kind of infer them, but you could also lose yourself pretty easily. Um, it's, it's not, it, it's a thinking book. It's a really a thinking book, a pondering book. And, uh, one of those books where you can see he's put a lot of effort into his words. So you, it's not a book you read through quickly. As I mentioned at the start, it does take a little bit of time and it does have some special concepts as well which I, I think are really cool he talks about the philosophical levity of of benjamin franklin and this is his kind of paradox between him being uh very prideful and and, and boasting of kind of his achievements um, because he did achieve a lot but whilst maintaining this humility and this idea of things going into the public comments such as the heat stove that he made um, and refused to patent, which helped out a lot of people and helped trap heat in the house and improved a lot of people's lives. There's a lot related to that. There's um, some really nice, just even one-off quotes and ideas, such as talking about Frederick Douglass, who was uh, a black man and, and um, you know, talking about civil rights and whatnot, and how he couldn't have the anonymity that someone like Benjamin Franklin did with his silence, uh, silence do good letters. Uh, and there's this just one sentence here, which is there's no virtue in anonymity for those who have no name, which was talking about how he kind of had no rights, uh, as a, as a black man. And so there was no point in being anonymous because he was trying to say something from a point of view which was already being treated as anonymous as a person with uh, no respectability no power and whatnot so some really cool things in this book and it really did get me thinking of you know should these book reviews be reviewed viewed as a cultural commons how would i feel if someone was straight up riffing off my ideas and audio and things like that 
And I, I think for the most part, I'm sure there'd be some actions which I would find egregious, but I, I personally would prefer this to go out to as many people as possible. And I, I don't particularly need to make money from that. Uh, or at the very least, it's like, as long as I make just enough <laughs> to get by, I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to be a billionaire from creating book reviews and whatnot. Uh, I would prefer, especially if that limits the idea or the ability for these ideas and, and my thoughts to escape out to the greater world. I would much prefer this to to be a, a, more, a closer to a cultural commons and viewed as an art piece that is enjoyable enjoyable by everyone who can create, cut, clip, quote from from this as much as they want, rather than it being like this is my property. I came up with these ideas. This is all mine. Um, I, I, I much prefer to to go to that other side. So, in summary, it's not light reading. It's not light reading, but it was fascinating. Uh, a great book for me is a book where it will give you multiple ideas of spin-off things, of avenues of investigation, which this has absolutely done. There's many ideas I want to investigate further and and uh, did so whilst even reading this book. It was probably close to the limit of my own vocabulary and ability to hold concepts. So it is heavy in that respect, um, but it does make me way more excited to learn about concepts I really care about, value for value, of property rights, of art and ownership of ideas, of uh, economic decision making, of how people interact with uh, as a group and as in individuals. All of these has, has just spin off uh, a lot of ideas for me. So I'm going to give this book, Common as Air, Revolution, Art and Ownership by Lewis Hyde an 8 out of 10. I think it's a, a pretty damn good book, but you've got to be interested in a lot of these things that I was talking about anyway. Otherwise, you will find it weighty, overly philosophical and boring. I could imagine myself reading this 10 years ago and going, ugh. That's, this, is, this is not for me. So thank you everyone for joining to the end of this video. What are your thoughts on the cultural commons, on the ability for people to restrict or own ideas of patent and copywriting of Lewis Hyde if you've read any of those other books? I would love to know all of these things. Please, please leave a, a comment down below and I always read and respond to them. And I would just recommend checking out the Mere Mortals podcast because all of these ideas, all of these things I expand upon in much greater detail with my co-host Juan and then also with guests that I get on. And so you will see a lot of the ideas of this book being influenced and talked about in that podcast. So we'll just recommend checking that out. It's also on YouTube and you can also find it in the audio version. So with all of that being said, I do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world and that these ideas and book reviews and concepts are spreading to you. And with all of that being said, ciao for now, Karen out.